Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation. Uh, Flex App One revolutionizes app delivery. Uh, before we go ahead and start today's presentation, I wanted to cover a bit of housekeeping information with all of you. Today's session is being recorded, so keep an eye on your inbox uh, in the day or so following the event for a link to the recording and uh, probably a link to the PowerPoint as well. If that's something that you would like to have for review or share with a colleague, maybe somebody that couldn't be here, um, we'll be sending that out to you. Uh, also, we do probably will have some time for questions and comments. Uh, probably save those mostly for the end of the presentation. But if you have any questions or comments for either of our presenters today, please feel free to direct them via the question or chat window, and we'll do our best to cover all the questions and comments as time allows. So with that being said, uh, again, welcome today to today's presentation. Uh, we're going to be led through the presentation by Jason E. Smith and Matt Boyajan, our uh, is also going to join us and add some uh, great color and do a great demo with us. So uh, we'll go ahead and turn, hand the ball over to Jason and he's gonna bring us through today's presentation. Thanks, Ray. We're excited about sharing with you new news from Liquidware, the FlexApp One feature set of FlexApp. Uh, we believe that after you see today's uh, webinar, after you see the demonstrations, you'll agree that it is revolutionary in the industry. Before we get started with that, I'm going to recap what Liquidware Labs uh, provides for the industry, a full digital workspace management suite. As a matter of fact, it's the only one that you're going to find in the industry. Um, anytime that you're getting ready to move to a new desktop or the ongoing management of a desktop, Liquidware has a solution for you. Uh, we can monitor the ongoing desktops, but even before that, we can assess for what desktop that you're going to move to. And we do that with Stratosphere UX monitoring and diagnostic solution. Our user environment management called Profile Unity enables you to seamlessly onboard users. At the very first login from one Windows session to the next, regardless of Windows version, and you're even gonna see an incredible all the way through to Windows 11 um, demonstration today, <clears throat> we will bring that profile forward and we will make sure user authored data is also available. So it gives you a zero downtime migration. Really, the user's never down. So the migration word is a little bit stretched there because it really provides a dynamic profile that just works across every version of Windows. Likewise, our application layering solution that we'll spend most of our time speaking about today, FlexApp, delivers applications that will work across all versions of Windows. As I alluded to, you'll see that in the demonstration today going across multiple versions of Windows. FlexApp does this by giving you a container for one or more applications in a VHD or a VHDX and a file system a filter driver at the Windows level to ensure that the applications appear on the desktop in their native form. And they work like they do in their native form. And you're using the CPU processing power in the native form. In that regard, we have a very high degree of compatibility that these applications will work across, far higher than anything else in the industry. So we're going to um, we're going to show you the entire uh, that that entire mantra about FlexApp today. <clears throat> I also want you to know that our solutions work across physical desktops, cloud-based desktops, and virtual desktops. So no matter how you deliver your Windows desktops, including something as new as cloud PC through Windows 365 our solutions work in the end. <clears throat> uh, more about FlexApp now as we move on to Flex, FlexApp and how we're revolutionizing application delivery, especially with our new FlexApp One feature set. FlexApp gives you dynamic application delivery. As I said, it works across all Windows desktops. Applications have always been elastic with FlexApp. We focus on the application first, not layering in all parts of the operating system, we leave that to the base image. And that's where our layering solution is very different than any other solution in the market. <clears throat> we separate, and as I said, we separate out that application delivery for OS delivery. So it doesn't matter if you're on Windows 7, all the way through soon to Windows 11 and all those versions of Windows 10 in between, your application will work if it supports the OS. We support virtually all application types, including the most modern ones with MSIX, executables, even homegrown applications we support with FlexApp. 
we give you the most flexible layer options in the industry at system boot or at login time with innovative click to layer and even based on triggers that occur for for environment changes during the session say a user moved to a different part of the building or they're logging in in from inside uh, an organization so they're on a, an approved ip address range applications unique to that user's usage for where they've logged on apply to that desktop automatically we support remote work from home work from anywhere strategies by supporting any remote desktop and actually also supporting application publishing technologies those from citrix amazon AppStream, and those from microsoft as well we enable a multi-cloud staging of application strategy so you may find that some solutions in the market go as far as supporting one cloud we support all three major clouds in the industry you don't even have to host your packages only file share can be hosted on blob storage for example and we lead the industry with innovation you'll see this on a separate slide a little later we're number one in what matrix uh, independent testing they don't accept sponsorships they chose flex app as the number one layering solution in the market Our main use cases and benefits are as follows, simplifying application management, supporting non-persistent desktops and VDI, so we make the applications return to the desktop at next login, improving the compatibility of the types of desktops and the types of users that use virtual desktops or advanced physical desktops. So no, only are, no longer is it just a task worker in a call center, you can apply advanced applications to knowledge workers as well. Simplifying base images perhaps could be the number one thing that FlexApp does. It leaves your base images unmodified from their existing state. They're very clean in that way and don't suffer from Windows rot, which is basically uh, tainting and tattooing the base image over time with multiple installs, uninstalls, and application updates. Because Flex apps are never installed to the desktop itself, they never taint the underlying base image. Also, it makes it very easy to update application uh, applications and gives you great business continuity. So if you need to switch from one type of desktop to the next in a moment's notice, all your Flex app application packages will support that next Windows desktop. We did this with many customers when the pandemic started last year. Many, many of their users had to be sent from home and given virtual desktops. The applications that they need were made available at next login because Flex apps work across any Windows delivery method without needing to be repackaged. Some of the things on this slide are a little bit redundant to what I've already covered. So I will uh, pick off just a couple of them to, to, to uh, point out. With FlexApp, you can avoid repackaging apps at every single OS update. Um, a lot of the technologies do not allow that, do not allow you to go across multiple versions of Windows. We call this package once. And also because FlexApp can be made part of Profile Unity's distribution uh, and management console, FlexApp gives you one central management console for both your user environment management and your application delivery. So then you can make registry changes. You can uh, do um, application fix ups for the registry in that way. You can apply application rights management. Maybe the user needs to be an, an administrator of a specific application. And you can do all those based on context aware settings or trigger points, depending on where the user is logged in and the permissions that they have. Reiterating that, you'll see the feature benefits on this page. Packaging applications once should not be understated. It's very time consuming using technologies out there in the industry and very frustrating to package up an application to only have it work with one version of Windows. And then when you patch that version of Windows, you have to repackage it. That's not the case with FlexApp. 
Flex app, when it's run in its enterprise form, has admin role-based role access through Profile Unity. The admin and user rights management that uh, can be used alongside it is unparalleled in the industry by giving you that one console. Fast packaging. Um, Flex apps can be packaged faster than any other technology in the industry. Packaging is almost uh, using a word that's too heavy handed because when you install a Flex app and capture it to a VHD or VHDX, that's exactly what you're doing. You're installing it and clicking, clicking next, next, next and finish. And soon we'll have packaging automation that will automate this entire process. So if you have dozens or hundreds of applications, we work with published silent switches from the major vendors to let you run through many application uh, installs, perhaps over a weekend, unattended. And then you're able to come back in and see all your Flex app packages already packaged and ready to test. Flex app, when used with Profile Unity, is context aware. You can do these app assignments based on user, based on group or department, time of day, as I mentioned, trigger points, and more. I'm going to really go back through this industry first because people ask, uh, common questions ask, how does this separate out from the tools that vendors like VMware or Citrix may provide in the, in the area of application layering? We continue to innovate. We continue to put a lot of development resources into our solution. The things that you see on this slide are ones that we innovated. In some cases, the competition is copied. We stay way out front of anyone else out there. So when you choose FlexApp, you have the most innovative solution in the market, and you'll see that with FlexApp 1 today. FlexApp, we were the first with micro isolation, and that way you didn't need to know which package, which application you wanted to package, in which order when applications needed to work with each other. <clears throat> Therefore, you headed off any DLL conflicts or any other conflicts for installing apps, and micro isolation overcame that. This is not full isolation, and FlexApp is not full isolation. We rely on technologies like MSIX or AppV for such functionality for full isolation. FlexApp is far more compatible with a list of applications that it can virtualize because we do not provide full isolation to our packages. We provide cloud native Flex apps, as I said, supporting all three major clouds in the industry. You don't even need a file share to host these, and then your Windows machines can recognize them and activate the Flex apps upon login or any of the trigger points that can be used in those scenarios. Flex app cache mode helps if the user or machine happens to go off right, offline temporarily, so you're not fully relying on a file share or for cloud storage. It brings and caches the application down to the endpoint. FlexApp cloud apps are pre-packaged applications that are available within the Profile Unity and FlexApp console, which allow you to test Flex apps very quickly. We have very many mostly open source applications that are already packaged up, and you can trial them without even packaging an app, which is also easy and the fastest packaging in the industry. The package once was also something we innovated not needing to repackage applications. Session isolation, being on an uh, RDS box server or on uh, Windows 10 multi-session and user A not seeing what user B has access to and cannot access those applications or use those applications. This keeps your base image management for those environments very streamlined. Perhaps you can get down to as many as one base image and one server for your server-based computing environments and multi-session environments because of this session isolation technology. So now the human resources department, for example, has the apps they need while the finance department may be hitting the exact same multi-session server and gets the applications that they need. FlexApp was the first layering solution on all three marketplaces for the cloud. And as you'll see in the next few slides and in the demonstration today, how FlexApp One is again revolutionizing the industry with self-contained application layers that are ideal for Microsoft application distribution, such as Endpoint Manager and SCCM. 
and you can use them for well-managed machines for offline use. This technology will be available planned for this quarter, perhaps as soon as next month. These self-contained packages are one application for one file in most cases. If you want to put multiple applications on one file, you can do that as well. For instance, send out one package to the department that you need uh, unique applications for and have it recognized across those. FlexApp distribution packages no longer require profile unity to get them to the endpoint. You can use these industry standard technologies in any application distribution method to get your Flex app package to the desktop. You can even host it in a file share um, of any type. You can email a package to an end user. They double click on it and it opens. It only leverages an embedded service. There is no unique Flex app player needed on the endpoint and the application is off and running. And that's where it's very different than any competition in the market. No heavy-handed player is needed or required on the endpoint for Flex App 1 packages. This gives you streamlined application layering methodology for base use cases or for application distribution use cases with Microsoft technologies. And you still have the option for leveraging Profile Unity and its integrated application distribution for advanced use cases and all the other features that Profile Unity works with alongside FlexApp, including application rights management, registry fix-ups, and more. And also, I should reiterate, this gives you the ability to run Flex app packages offline for the first time ever with well-managed PCs and laptops. What does well-managed mean? It means a machine that you've had relatively locked down and a user has not installed and uninstalled applications over the course of time and caused that machine to suffer from poor performing Windows rot or things that could cause multiple conflicts. FlexApp runs very well in well-managed PCs and laptops. This is a very new graphic, and it'll be in a forthcoming solution brief from us, so you're seeing this for the first time. This graphic actually describes FlexApp in the way it works, although it does say FlexApp 1 here. If you'll focus on the left-hand side, I'll talk about what a, a, a traditional software installation does. When you install an application, Actual files and modifications go to multiple places all over the Windows system. System file, any other files, program data, System32 files, it taints the registry. What we call this is tattooing the registry, and then when you uninstall files, some things are left behind. Some things remain even though it was supposed to be a clean uninstall. Unless you can snapshot back to an earlier base image, you will have Windows rot over time. This is a huge industry problem and causes even end-user PCs that run disconnected to suffer from poor, very poor performance and file conflicts over time. I'm sure you've seen this in your own environment where you can take even an older PC and rebuild that with the latest version of Windows from scratch and it runs like a brand new PC. This is largely due to Windows rot caused by applications installing and uninstalling over time. When a Flex app package comes into a Windows environment, now focus on the right side, there is no tainting or tattooing of the underlying Windows image. All the files that you see there and any other ones where the application may have wanted to install remain physically un touched on the hard drive uh, in any way in the base image. There's a filter driver that makes every single file that that application needed look as if it is in those native locations. So while you may go looking in the system folder or the program data folder for files that may have been modified, they will look like they've been modified but if the filter driver is disabled or turned off, they disappear almost like a ghost. They were never there. So therefore, these machines never 
suffer from Windows rot. When you remove an application with FlexApp, it is forever gone. There's no tainting or tattooing of the system. This is where it's very different than any other technology out there, especially our FlexApp 1 application that you're about to see a demonstration of today. This is the way Flex App in general runs, whether you run it with Profile Unity with advanced enterprise functionality or Flex App 1 individual feature sets that has the service embedded that works with that filter driver that makes applications appear as if they're in the local system, but they're not. So you end up with a much better scenario and, and a lot less things to troubleshoot. You can streamline your base images if this is the case, right? Because you can get down to as little as one base image, even for an environment that supports thousands of users. I'm going to turn today's presentation over to Matt Voyagen, our system engineer who has helped innovate many of the features and functionality also in FlexApp. Matt, take it away from here. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. So first, what we're going to take a look at is Intune, aka Endpoint Manager, and we're going to use this to go and add an application that we all suffer through a lot, which is Google Chrome. As we know, it constantly changes and requires lots of updates. So we're going to make this really, really simple with a self-contained FlexApp 1 configuration. I'm going to be pushing this to my productivity as well as my business users, and we're going to go to the next area that allows me to define the install and uninstall commands. In this case, doing a bunch of different things here. I'm doing sync, which is a block level copy of a file to an existing folder. We're also doing a system switch, which creates shortcuts on the public areas versus user areas, and we'll create registry tracker in the HK local machine section. I'm using CTL, which is our click to layer technology, which only activates the application once you click on it, keeping overhead extremely low. And I'm also using the add to start switch, which allows me to add a FlexApp one binary shortcut to a folder inside of the start menu to make things easier to track. Now, in the uninstall place, we're also doing things like the system removing our shortcuts in public areas. We're stopping the closing of applications and the keys and layers to make sure it comes out clean. Clean removes our shortcuts and registry keys in each key current user, and remove removes all the FlexApp 1 binary. So remember what Jason said before, how everything here is modular. It's going to reduce Windows rot. We're doing that all automatically. And then, of course, our dependency is the FlexApp 1 service, which is included in the executable itself. So now we're going to skip through so our supersedence and we're going to work on our assignments. In this case, we're going to decide who gets this package through Intune, aka Endpoint Manager. So I get to publish to my groups, I get to upload my package, and there you go. That is how you push a FlexApp 1 single executable to all the users in your enterprise with full group management just like you would any other application. So now we're going to see things from a different perspective. We're going to have our user log into a clean instance of Windows 10 version 1909. This is not a ringer system. This is actually a pretty low case system with just a couple cores added to it. And we're going to see what happens when we log into our own company portal. So Mr. Rue here in our little recorded session is going to be going and doing that for us. So he types in his password, he gets to his desktop, and then the company portal goes and opens up for him. Now, what are we going to do with this portal? Right now, you can see my start menu is really basic. All I've got is just pretty basic parts of the Windows ISO. I think there was also Office loaded in there. And what we're going to do is we're going to transplant some applications that were never meant for Windows 10 into Windows 10. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do some 3D pinball. You guys might remember this. That was included back in the Windows 95 days. We're actually going to transplant that into Windows 10 using FlexApp 1 and using my portal. And you can see right in the bottom right hand corner, Intune has already started the FlexApp 1 3D pinball package. We can do this with any other package that we want. I've got Firefox right on the screen right here, but I can also do Brave. I can do Teams. If you notice, there was a Teams loader in there. And because of the switches that I've chosen, I've got that nice little FlexApp folder for 3D pinball. So we're going to click on that. And there you go, the ultimate Windows 95 throwback of 3D pinball inside of a Windows system delivered via Endpoint Manager through my company portal. And as we can see, 3D pinball is linked as a Flex app, which creates its own VHDX that's listed as a local drive. So essentially, all the stuff that you know and love about FlexApp has been expanded into a single self-extracting executable. And that's 
that's the same for every single one of the applications that you see here. So we're talking about Paint.net or Brave or Firefox or Share uh, or ShareX or any of the things that you see here, all of them were created using this FlexApp One methodology. And why that matters is because think about what Jason was saying earlier about Windows Rod. As I go through 10 or 12 or 14 different iterations of Chrome, there's all that junk left behind in the operating system. If I have one application that doesn't play nicely with another, again, there's all that junk left over in the operating system. And it's not just in places like the file system, it's also in places like the registry. So having this instant modular deployable method of applications is really the next generation of not only application deployment for virtual systems, but for anything that you want, desktops, laptops, VDI, cloud, WBD, the brand new Windows 365, all of these things will work with the same set of applications. Now, I know that Saul is like a tall order, being able to take your applications and put them into any environment that you want. And this is just a recording. It's not exactly walking the tightrope. So it doesn't give us a really clear indication of how far we can push this technology. So what we're going to do now is something a little different. I'm going to have Jason transfer rights over to me. And we're actually going to work inside of my lab. And we're going to really push the boundaries of what FlexApp One can go and deliver. So we're going to go do that right now. And you should be able to see my screen. And as soon as you can see my screen, you should be seeing just a basic Hyper-V setup. Okay, nothing really special here. So, Jason, can we see all that? Can you see my, my random old Hyper-V thing? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the mainstay. We're going to start off with some Server 2019. And this is a fairly fresh instance of Server 2019. I haven't really been playing around with it. This is a basically a new OS deployment. And you can see it's really simple. This was the basic deployment of the ISO. There's not really a whole lot going on here. And I don't have any applications installed on the system, so to speak. So if I go to apps and features, there's nothing here. This is a clean instance of Windows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to a UNC path. Now, remember what Jason was talking about before, we specifically brought up Intune or Endpoint Manager. But you have to remember, we don't care about the deployment methodology. So you can use SCCM, you can use Intune, you can use OneDrive, you can use uh, Amazon WorkDocs, you can use Dropbox Business. We do not care how you deploy these things. They're just executables. So as you can see, I've got a whole bunch of executables here, and I'm going to pick two of these out. I'm going to get my FlexApp one capture number one and my FlexApp one capture number two. You can see the two of these together weighing around 2.3, 2.4 gigabytes. So what I'm going to do is just double click on the FlexApp one executable so you guys can see what's going on behind the scenes with Endpoint Manager. So there needs to be an elevation piece, which everything does for you, including Endpoint Manager. And then as soon as I go and do that, there's a whole bunch of stuff on this system now. In fact, if I go to this folder, all of these applications are now present on my system. I did that in about two seconds. So let's 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 start taking a look behind the curtain and see what's actually going on here. So let's fire up Windows Explorer and let's navigate to places like C program files and let's navigate to places like x86 and things like that so we can actually see what's going on here. And as we go in there, notice there's a whole bunch of folders in here that weren't in here before. There's a whole bunch of applications that I have in here that weren't present before. And if I go to my apps and features area, you're going to see, oh my goodness, look at all these applications that were just installed. All of that was done with a single self-contained executable. Now, we're going to open a whole bunch of these up. So we're going to do some 7-zip, which has a bunch of right-click context associations, and we're going to do some Evernote, because why not? Everyone, well, no one uses Evernote anymore, but it's still there. It's nice to know that it still works. And we're going to do some FileZilla because, well, we still have the need for FTP once in a while. And we're going to do some GOM player for some nice high output AV. And no, I don't have sound. That's why it's going to go complain. And no, I don't want your updates. We're going to minimize that. And we're also going to do some Google Earth Pro. Now, remember, this is Hyper-V, so it's going to go and complain that I don't have the right video drivers segmented. And yeah, that's fine. I really don't care. We're going to have it go and close that and reload it in DirectX mode so it's nice and happy. And there we go. Google Earth Pro is nice and loaded. And we're going to see that nice little shot of planet Earth going and superseding. And if we want to be really fun, 
we can even force this to enter flight simulator mode and we're going to go and put this on the uh the runway of new york with an f-16 there you go instant flight simulator which is pretty cool so in the midst of doing all that we're going to add some more stuff in here we're going to do some green shot which replaces my windows print screen functionality and you can see that that is loaded up right here we're going to do some image burn which goes and uses some virtual device drivers to talk to a virtual burner that doesn't really exist. We're going to go fire off some stuff like Mad VR, and we're going to do some Media Player Classic and basically just really load the system up. And we'll do some Notepad, and we'll do some PZIP, and we'll do some Pigeon, and we'll do some VLC, and we'll do some Winamp. So we just load it up, I don't know, good 10, 15 applications. And that's not my entire application set. I'm also going to fire up this FlexApp Capture number two. If you notice, as soon as I double clicked on that, suddenly I have a whole lot more applications. I have the entire open office suite. I've got a bunch of browsers. I've got all my sys internals tools. So we're gonna fire some of these off too and see how FlexApp One is delivering those. So first off, we'll start with one of the heavy hitters. We'll start with Google Chrome because all it's gonna do is eat up all my memory. And we're gonna go to liquidware.com because we have some nice HTML5 videos that it's gonna go and load up for us. So we're gonna go see those render and we're gonna see those just big get splashed across the screen. And there we go. Talking about our cool record published articles and other fun stuff that Jason and Ray are working on. And now we're gonna go do some other stuff. We're gonna do some open office calc. And I'm just going to run through this installer because it's never seen me before. And there you go. Now I've got my spreadsheet editor. And we're going to do some open office writer at the same time. And there we go. Load it up nice and fast. And then we're going to fire off a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll do some AD access enumerator. And we're going to do some AD explorer. And again, I've never run these before. So it's asking me to accept. And we're going to do some BG info 64. So it can go and tattoo my desktop with all the stuff that I like to learn about my machine. And there it is right there. And we're going to do some cache set to learn about the Windows cache configuration, and there you go. We're going to do some desktops to give Windows Server a whole bunch of virtual desktops, just like Windows 11 does, which is pretty cool. And what else do we want to do here? Let's do some Process Explorer 64-bit, just so we can see what's going on behind the scenes. And finally, we're going to open up Task Manager to show you what's going on in the back end. And if you notice, I'm not really using a whole lot of resources here. My CPU is really low, my memory utilization low, my consumption is basically all the executables that I ran in that tiny little filter driver that Jason was talking about. And that is how I can take a single server instance operating system. And with as little as two clicks, I can deploy a hundred different applications to it, all running within an individual layer. So they get all the benefits that Jason was talking about before. They're completely compartmentalized. I can remove them instantly if I want to. On top of that, they have registry isolation. They have DLL isolation. And if these applications go away, they're not contributing to the rot of the operating system. But most importantly, I can control them, update them, modify them using whatever interface that I want and now these are under my complete control, regardless of where the user is. So I can use, again, Intune to do this. I can use OneDrive to do this. I can use my own classic SCCM. It does not matter. What you have essentially done here is you've created modular applications. Now, one of the biggest things that Jason said when he was talking about this presentation was, package once. And he kind of, kind of ran through that and said, eh, you only have to package once. And he said, really, if you package on an older version of Windows, anything that's newer, it's just going to work. And that, that, <laughs> that sounds crazy, right? Because there's no other solution that can do that. You can't do that with AppV. You can't do that with any other layering solution. So how does FlexApp One do that? Well, let's go find out. Now, remember, when we capture things, uh, this is a very special part of what we do. When we capture things inside of FlexApp, we're not doing just a differential capture where you snapshot something and then you snapshot the OS again and then whatever lies in the middle is the application. What we do is what's known as a thread-based capture. So we're going to basically take the application, see what the installer does, and whatever the installer does, we're going to forward that into a VHDX. Now, by doing that, you're not capturing the noise in the junk of Windows, and that's very important because that's the secret sauce that allows us forward compatibility. So we just did our Flex App captures on server 2019, you know, basic operating system. Now we're going to do is we're going to move into the latest version of Windows 10, which is Windows 10 21H1. So I know a lot of you guys haven't moved to this update yet because it is really recent. 
Um, you are going to see some of the new language that Microsoft's chosen. Edge is now part of the operating system, all that cool, fun stuff. So this is actually newer than the captures that I made. So what we're going to do is we're going to navigate back to my, uh, my little system again. We're going to input my credentials, and we're going to go after those two little executables that defined all the things that we saw in Server 2019. So I'm going to capture your, copy those from here to here. Oops, I put that in the wrong location. Let's go and undo that. Let's try that again. There we go, and this is why we like Intune, is that it doesn't have fat fingers like I do. <laughs> what we're gonna do now is the same thing that we did before. We're just gonna double click our Flex App ones, and we're gonna have those run, and we're gonna see that everything is added right to the desktop. I also have them in the Start menu, but eh, the Start menu is kind of obnoxious. And I'm gonna do the same thing that I did before with my Flex App capture number two as well, and we see that both of the application sets are now present on the system. Now, we were previously ran these, same app, same app, executables we ran these in server 2019 and we're kind of used to how that ran so what happens when we do the same thing the answer is nothing changes everything should be identical with the exception of now I don't have server manager and now my start menu looks a little bit different because I have the names essentially propagated out here but other than that aside from the code of paint that's on this operating system everything still runs exactly the same way it did before so in fact, if I fire off Google Earth, it's going to give me that same message about Hyper-V and the unsupported graphics card. So we're just going to go and switch to DirectX mode. There we go. We're going to fire that off again. And this time we're going to put a different plane on a different runway for our little flight simulator just to have some more fun. So we'll do an SR-22 to a plane and we'll do that in Kilimanjaro. That sounds fun. Let's start a flight there. And there we go, fully rendered right there in the runway. So we'll also do some green shot. We'll do some image burn the same way we did it before. And remember, I am replacing a lot of Windows functionality here with some of these applications. So if I hit print screen, I'm not using Windows print screen anymore. I'm now using the FlexApp 1 copy of green shot that was just loaded resin into the system. And we'll do some more Mad VR and Media Player Classic. And we'll do some media info just to keep things fun. And we'll do some Notepad++ and some pzip and some Pigeon and some TerraCopy. Now, TerraCopy is really cool because it replaces the Windows copy handler. So I'm no longer using Windows Explorer to copy things over. Now I can just use TerraCopy or, in this case, whatever I want to load into the Windows shell. And we'll do some VLC. We'll do it skinned and unskinned. We'll do some Winamp for some Blast of the Past stuff. We'll do some Windows stat. And we'll also do – I'm running out of real estate here. We're also going to do some uh, – WinRAR, and we'll do some WinSCP. So lots and lots and lots of applications. And now we're going to append to that all the stuff that we have in my second FlexApp capture. So we'll do some more of my system internals tools like AD Access Enumerator. We'll do some AD Access Explorer. We'll go and, you know, leave me alone. We'll go and minimize that. We'll do some BG Info 64 just the way we did before. And we're going to see if we can go and tattoo our desktop background. And we're doing that right now. And we're going to go and see what else we can fire off. We'll do some more Google Chrome. And this time we'll go someplace a little different just to keep it fresh. So we'll go to Microsoft.com. There we go. I have that going load up. They always love it when you do that through Chrome. They always immediately <laughs> say, hey, you want to use Edge? We got your Edge right here. So anyway, we'll also fire off some uh, open office calc to get our spreadsheet back. And we'll finish that up. And we'll do some writer. And I think that's a pretty good application set. Now, remember, we never killed our first session. So I am looking at this session, and I've also got my Windows Server session still up. So I can see that these applications are still live and still running, same executables, completely different operating system, and everything works exactly the way that you would expect. It's fast, it's efficient, and if I go and right-click on these and stop them, all the applications will be instantly removed, preventing that Windows bloat that Jason was talking about. But... The last piece of this, the best of this, is what we're going to cover now. So I know a lot of you guys are really concerned because Microsoft kind of told us, they said, hey, Windows 10 is going to be around for a really long time, and we're just going to keep updating it. And every six months, there's going to be some feature updates and system updates that you have to keep up with. And we said, fine, whatever. As long as you just don't change that, we're going to be cool. And then what do they do two weeks ago? They say, oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, Windows 11 is going to be coming out soon. And that's a problem because that means a lot of our applications have to get recaptured. But what if they didn't have to? 
what if you could create this modular entity and not have it just work on server 2016 and 2019 and any variant of Windows 10, but what if the migration to Windows 11 wasn't painful anymore? What if I could migrate your profiles? What if I could migrate your applications? What if I could use FlexApp 1 to deploy these applications to the laptops and not have to recapture them? Well, we're going to find out what that looks like. So this is the latest copy of Windows 11 right here. This is version 22,000.71, just got released a few days ago. So we're really walking the tightrope here. And we're going to put this in full screen mode. And come on, Windows 11, you can do it. I'm going to try that one more time. There we go. OK, so nice modern interface. Nice modern login screen. We're going to go log into that now. And there we go. We've got the brand new Windows 11 set up. I haven't really modified this, so I kept all the default apps that were inside of it. So all the brand new modern apps, all the Windows security stuff, weather, office, all that stuff I left installed. And you can see all the rest of the modern apps are still here. I kept the start menu in its centered interface. I've got the new weird right click stuff. And what we're going to do is we're going to do exactly what we just did inside of our other environment, which is I'm going to get my two flex app captures, my two executables. And again, I can use whatever deployment mechanism I want for these. And I'm just going to copy these little files to my desktop the same way that Intune would do or SCCM or even OneDrive. And I'm going to double click on the flex app capture number one. And what are we expecting is going to happen here? We're expecting the exact same behavior is going to occur. So Windows 11 is a little bit different in terms of elevation. So if you notice, I did not get that message of, hey, we require elevation here. Because again, the UI has changed around a little bit and they have done some automation for us. But everything else is exactly the same. So here's my 7-zip file manager. Let's really start ripping through this and see how the behavior and more importantly, the performance is going to look like for us. So we already did some 7-zip. We'll do some more FileZilla. We're going to do some Evernote. And if you notice, there's a lot of new visual cues in Windows 11. So there's some cool shadowing. The edges are kind of sharpened up. Whenever I have a window, it kind of does this really nice drop shadow thing underneath the other one. And everything works and looks and walks and talks exactly the same way it did before. So if we do some Google Earth Pro, we're going to do another flight simulator mode just because we're going to see how that behaves as well. So I'm going to let Google Earth load up. We're going to, yeah, I know, unsupported graphics card, switch in DirectX mode. Yes, please. And we're going to go and fire that off again and see how it behaves. And there you go. There's our good old Google Earth navigating to the United States. And what we're going to do is just like before, we're going to enter another flight simulator mode. And this time we're going to do an F-16 in London Heathrow. Why not? <laughs> so there it goes. So we're also going to fire off again, just to show you that the winners integration stuff is going to work the way you expect. We're going to do some green shot. We're going to do some image burn. So there's a lot of important reasons why I'm choosing these applications. We're replacing default Windows functionality. We're oh, Windows security is reviewing my files for green shot and we're going to dismiss that. Um, Remember that I've chosen difficult applications on purpose because applications with device driver requirements or applications that go and replace parts of Windows that are default Windows functionality, that's not easy stuff to do. But the whole point of this is if I can do this with your worst applications, imagine how I do with your mainstream stuff. Imagine how I do with your in-house written applications that normally cause you problems. Well, for us, this is just child's play. And I have a new way of deploying, a new way of managing, a new way of interacting with applications that doesn't require abstraction the same way that AppV does or SVS does or ThinApp does. So there is significantly less overhead here. And you can see it even as I'm just clicking around, as I'm going through these applications, they just work and they're running at full speed. And even if I start clicking through five, six, seven, eight, nine applications at a time, they all just run the way they're supposed to. Now, again, some of those are easy apps. Some of those are difficult apps. We're going to go to my second application set again, and we're going to start picking through some of the sys internals tools. So we're going to do some more access enumerator. We're going to do some AD Explorer. Again, just to go and play with that. And again, everything stays nice and solid and nice and simple. We'll do some BG Info 64 so I can go tattoo my desktop and show you how that whole process works. And you can see Hyper-V showing up there. I've already got virtual desktops here. Uh, this little, little view I have here for screen display, I can do that already. So there's really no point in running it again, um, but we can do that just to have some fun. Yeah, I know, I know, dismiss. This is, you know, this is funny because they wrote this and they're still trying to send this to Windows security. That's kind of interesting.
We're also going to fire off uh, some good old Google Chrome, just the way we did before. And uh, let's go set it to their training site. Or better yet, we're going to go to community.liquidware.com. Now, if you guys have never seen this before, this is a new forum we opened up a couple of years ago where you can share things with other clients. Um, I really like this for Profile Unity and FlexApp stuff. So if you have questions, if you want to take a look at recipes, if you want to see how to go and build things, like how to go and create the best FlexApp packaging consoles, there's a lot of really cool stuff in here for you to go play around with. And we're also going to go and fire off our good friend OpenOffice so we can go and play around with that again. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to open up the taskbar so we can see exactly how many resources we're using and again because this is not virtualization of applications we can see the overhead is pretty much nothing and even though I'm running all these applications the CPU utilization is nice and low the memory utilization is nice and low everything's nice and fast even though I'm working with an alpha version of Windows 11 and even crazy stuff like Process Explorer 64 is just going to go and run for us the way it's supposed to so I can go and dig inside of the bowels of the operating system and see everything that it's doing. Now, again, the way we described this before is I'm not just doing this on one operating system. I'm doing it simultaneously on three. So that same work that I was doing on server 2019, that's still there. That work that I was doing inside of Windows 10, simultaneously, that's still there. So these are the same executables running on three completely completely different operating systems across multiple generations of kernel development without me having to redo that work. And that's something that you can't get with any other platform. And it really shows you how to flex the muscles, no pun intended, of FlexApp One. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is everything I had for a demo today. I do believe we had some extra time scored away so we could open this up for a Q&A. But with that, I'm going to turn everything back over to Ray. Ray, the floor is yours, sir. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Um, that amazing presentation. That's the first time I've seen that one. And wow, that's that's pretty pretty awesome. Uh, we do have some questions coming up here. So let me uh, pull those up for us. And um, one of the first questions that we had was, how do I get access to fast packaging? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, the short answer is contact us. We do have free downloads on our website where you can pull down the Profile Unity and Flex app installers. But if you're really looking to jumpstart your project, take a look at sales at liquidware.com, send us a message or go to liquidware.com and, and fill out a registration form and let us know you would like us to show you this firsthand. Because we have documentations and training videos to do all this stuff and walk you through it. But if you really want to supercharge your deployment, get us involved because we can show you how to build the best flex app packaging consoles and we can show you how a single capture in that console can enable fast packaging as well as package once so really the short answer to that question is installing the software in its default state will give you both things but if we're involved we'll get you going even faster yep so the fast packaging is the experience of the packaging console when compared against <clears throat> anybody else in the industry we package up an app in about the same time it takes to install it one time. Uh, others go through a capture process and a delta differential, and it will add 30 minutes to two hours to an install capture process where we are so close to real-time install. That's where that term comes from. Now, by fast packaging, if you're thinking about the automation that we'll soon be making available, that will be, all this planned avail availability will be this quarter as well. So the automation will, will be soon. If you'd like to uh, trial that, if you're an existing customer, you can contact us, as Matt said, and, and, and we'll uh, hook you up with one of our engineers who will let you sample that. Matt, you showed your demo um, where you captured tons of applications, and you put them in those two folders where you wanted them to go, right? Um, but we could also do something with you know, 10, 15, 20 applications and show them only in native locations of Windows, right? So if you if the if the user was looking for for Firefox under their start menu, they'd see the icon right where right where it'd been packaged, right? So it's a very exactly. native experience in that regard too. And the, the reason I show it in that 
and that method was for two reasons. Number one, every time I have to click the start menu, I have to click it and then sort through it. And that's just way too slow. We don't have time for that. But the other reason is working with enterprise customers. How often do you have a specialized area for your help desk or a specialized folder for your call center or a specialized folder for your company's applications? And the answer is we run into that about 90% of the customers that we work with. So mm -hmm. when you're looking to do custom stuff like this, it's really easy for us to do it. Yep. If you want to subscribe to the method that Jason's saying, which is let it be native, let it live in the start menu, that's fine too. You should have control over those things and it should be easy to do. Excellent. Well, we got a lot of questions here, so I'm going to keep firing off on them and uh, questions are still coming in here. So someone asked, is it possible to create flexible app one packages with fast packaging yes by default that's exactly how it's going to function so your output in the packaging console matt will say you know do you want this as a flex at one right that's correct so right now in the beta i have to create a flex app package and then convert it to flex app one the process is still as fast as it takes to run an installer. So as long as it takes to run an installer, that's how long it takes to capture an application using fast packaging with FlexApp. Here's a question for Jason. Um, they said, Jason, how is FlexApp licensed? Is it named user or concurrent sessions? Either way. And um, um, it is a feature set of FlexApp. So this is not a new product, just to be clear, as I had said at the beginning of the webinar, it's a feature set of FlexApp. So in its full form, you could use it with Profile Unity and have the advanced features um, uh, and advanced distribution method that you see in the Profile Unity console, or you could create a FlexApp one package. Um, Jason, not you, Jason, but a different Jason asks, what are some of the top advantages of FlexApp one versus traditional FlexApp? Ooh, that's a fun one. Mm -hmm. So with traditional FlexApp, you need to communicate with the network at some point. So if we're talking about FlexApp in a UNC state, you fire up your VPN or your start before login VPN client, or if you're in VDI or on-prem, you just log into the domain. You talk to the share, you pull the Flex app down, and then you run it, which is fine. Um, and we also have DR and HA built in there. So if your storage area goes down, we can cache that area for up to a week. And that's, that's good, having that DR for a week. But how well does that apply to what we find ourselves now in, which is laptops deployed at somebody's house with spotty VPN service during COVID. And the answer is, if you're pushing things directly from the cloud through S3 or through Azure Blob Storage or Google Buckets, it's fine, but not everyone has that. Some people have spotty internet coverage. We need local application installs. We need it. There, there is no question about this. So it shouldn't just be a question of, can I cache the app for a week? It should be, can I keep the application indefinitely? So have all those nice benefits of FlexApp, but not have an expiration date in the application because I still want control over the application from an IT department's perspective, but I don't want to lose the app after a week if I simply don't have internet coverage or haven't connected into the VPN or if I'm not losing cloud. So the whole point of FlexApp One is giving you more choice. Application layering started off as something that was clearly segmented towards virtualization and then expanded to cloud machines. The question that our customers are asking us is, why can't it be used for everything? I, I'm, I don't wanna pay two teams to go and package things and deploy things. It shouldn't be different. My company should do things one way to be very efficient. This is our way of closing the loop, to be able to say it doesn't matter how or why you want to run FlexApp, you should be able to run it any way that you want. Excellent. Uh, Blake asked a few questions here, so I'm going to kind of combine some of them together here. He asked, what about interaction with antivirus tools and things like cookie history within browsers, especially SSO? So. The way that FlexApp and FlexApp One function is that from an OS perspective, these are native applications. So this isn't something that you have to worry about like you would in AppV or SVS or ThinApp where you have to say, do I abstract this? Do I let it talk to the operating system? Do I hide the OS from it? No, it's all native. So what happens with your single sign-on and your cookies and any data that you have, all of that's going to be stored inside of your user profile. So registry data will flow to the registry and HKey current user. 
and then file data will flow to the user profile in, in basically app data local and app data roaming. That data will always persist. So even if you remove the application, the data should, for your profile should always stay there. So it shouldn't matter what you're using for a profile solution. You could be using nothing, or you could be using profile unity, or you could be using FS logics. It shouldn't matter. It should always just roam around with you regardless of where you go. Now, when it comes to AV solutions, there's two ways of looking at it. Number one, can you use FlexF1 to capture an EV? The answer is yes, but please don't do it. <laughs> so, so some of my customers have come back and said, hey, Matt, I flexed up McAfee or I flexed up semantic endpoint protection. No, don't do that. Y your security and your HIP solutions should be baked into your image and managed as a separate entity. And, and the reason we say that is because FlexApp can really easily push things and pull things from the system. And FlexApp 1 expands on that where I can use now whatever I want to do that. But it also means I can make a mistake and accidentally remove it. So we generally recommend that the security tools are hard coded into your systems. So if somebody fat fingers something, you can't accidentally pull them out. Now, the other way to think about this is how does FlexApp interact with AV? And the answer is the same way any other standard application does. So if you remember when I was firing off all my apps, specifically my system internals tools in Windows 11, there was a couple things that fired up that said, hey, do you want me to look at this? That same behavior would occur if I ran it locally versus non flexed apt. So that's the answer to your question is that it runs native. Excellent. We still got a bunch of questions here, so we're going to kind of try to speed through some of them. Um, Blake also asks, what about interaction between programs like Word in combination with the DMS? So something like a DMS or more specifically, if we're talking about plugins, um, the reality is everything is going to work natively. So however that application would function as you installed it, whether we're talking about a DMS or if we're talking about an Office plugin, an Outlook plugin, a Word plugin, anything else, it's going to function exactly the same way it would natively. And that sounds a little odd because a lot of people are used to dealing with things like we're with AppV and ThinApp where everything's encapsulated. You have to decide how it talks to the operating system. FlexApp, and this is gonna sound weird, isn't really about applications, it's about storage. So when I take an application and a registry and encapsulate it in a VHDX and then link it to a system, all we're doing is saying, hey, these files, these registry objects, these drivers, these DLLs, whatever they exist, I'm just gonna plug them into the system using a filter driver. And I'm gonna let that filter driver take care of any conflicts for the DLL and registry. But beyond that, these applications are gonna show up the exact same way they would natively in Windows which means it doesn't matter what you're running on top of what other application, if it runs natively, it's gonna run here. Yeah. Hey, um, Ray, can I share my screen? Oh, yep, let me uh, give you control. While you're doing that, Jason, let me ask uh, a question here um, to keep us uh, moving along here. Some people ask, does FlexApp 1 come with their profile Unity? Yes. It's a feature set of it. So it wants your license to use FlexApp, your license to use um, your license to use FlexApp one. Okay. And then with that, somebody, a few people have asked um, if they're using a different profile solution other than profile unity, um, can they still use FlexApp? Absolutely. Works seamlessly. If you're using something like uh, the old AppSense or the, if, if RES, if you still got those legacy products around, I'm, tongue in cheek on them that they're owned by Avanti now, um, it will work just fine. So um, you can uh, also inquire with us about licensing, uh, specifically FlexApp, you'll still have the Profile Unity console if you have those solutions and, and we'll work with you on that. I um, Can you see my, you can see my screen now, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Matt showed a very advanced demo. I'll show you a basic one. So what if a user wanted Fox, at, we needed a PDF tool, for example, right? And I'm starting to use FlexApp ones in production and I work from home and I'm not full-time connected to anything else, right? So um, this package was made available to me from one of our uh, system engineers and it says Foxit Reader executable and that's what it was named. This is actually a FlexApp one package. It is not the installer for Flex at, for Foxit Reader. And if you look at my uh, desktop, you'll see I've got a PDF on it can you see my desktop? Yep. Um, uh, right now I'm seeing just a zoom with your mouse in Windows Explorer. I'm not seeing your desktop. Uh, 
I need to change what I'm sharing. I need to change and, and share out uh, share out the entire screen. While that's working, let's go ahead and yeah. answer some other questions, or are you ready to move on? Yeah, I'm good. Sorry. So um, if I wanted Foxit Reader, it's never been installed here, and you see my desktop had uh, has an icon on it to a PDF. It's not even associated with anything yet. See it? Um, so uh, I'll go back to uh, that Foxit Reader. I'll double-click it. This machine could have never had anything liquidware on it before. As you'll see, this package is opened up. The filter driver is activated. Foxit Reader is now in this environment, and uh, it's available exactly where it's been installed as well under the Start menu and everywhere else. So when, now when I go to open this, I should get an option of what do I want to open it with. Well, it's already identified it with Foxit Reader. So um, that's how native it is with the OS. It looked like it was installed, and the OS thought it was installed, and now I'm able to open up this, in this case, this white paper. So Matt showed you a very advanced demo, and that's a, that's a very basic one, how you would have one package per app. Go ahead with questions. Uh, so I'm kind of skipping through them. There's some ones that we've kind of already covered. Um, are there size limitations for the packages? Right now, there is a four gigabyte compressed limit for a single FlexApp one package. And the reason for that is there's actually an executable limit inside of Windows where executables can only be so large. We are working on changing that in later versions of FlexApp one where we're either going to segment this to a separate executable or push it into a single executable or maybe do some swapping. We still have to talk about that. But right now, four gigabytes compressed for the beta version of FlexApp one is where we're at. Great. So almost eight gigs of data when you're all said and done. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, licensing questions. Someone asked, does FlexApp come, or is FlexApp one a different license than VDI Essentials? Uh, it would be included as part of FlexApp. We're just giving it away for free. Because <laughs> VDI Essentials is our entire suite uh, for uh, uh, FlexApp, Profile Unity, and Stratosphere. And FlexApp 1 is a feature set of FlexApp. All right, let's see here. I'm still scrolling through. Got a lot of questions and comments still. Uh, Will Profile Unity need to be upgraded to get FlexApp 1? Yes. The packaging console is the main thing, right, Matt? Correct. We'll That's correct. So we're, we're planning on releasing it all as part of one profile unit deployment, but you can get it available separately as a packaging console. But short answer, yes, Pro you would have to be upgraded to get it. Um, but you don't have to upgrade your production environment if you don't want to. You can do a separate console or anything else. So if you want to test this out, we can work with you. Someone asked, would you recommend FlexApp 1 and delivery via um, a CCM or uh, FlexApp Infra? and FlexApp packages for a customer using or will start using FlexApp only? That's a tough question. I would have to know more about the environment in order to answer that because it would really depend on a number of factors. Um, so first off, are we talking about systems that include VDI and cloud and desktops only or are laptops in play in, as well? If laptops are in play, do you subscribe to a cloud provider solution? If, if the answer to those first few questions is yes, and the answer to the second question is no, so you have a mix of desktops, laptops, VDI, cloud, and you're not a cloud subscriber for things like S3, then I would actually do both. I would do a combination of both FlexApp and FlexApp One. What's great about it is, again, you don't have to rebuild the packages. So if I have a FlexApp package, we can convert that into a FlexApp One, and you can run both. What winds up happening is you can have one package that works for four different versions of Windows. And then the FlexApp one is simply an extension of that package. It's just converted to an executable. And that process takes about 30 seconds. So the short answer is it depends on your environment. That's, we're giving you so many options because customers have a lot of different needs in this post COVID world. And we handle each one on a case by case basis because our objective is 
the least amount of work for you, the path of least resistance. I don't want you hiring more engineers. I don't want you doing more work than you have to. I want you doing less work, less image management, less deployments, less packaging, less overhead. Um, let's see. Someone asked, how does FlexApp One handle uh, updates initialized by the application itself? Does it update the package then? So what happens is we create something called a child differential disk. Um, if your user has admin rights and the application pushes through in that mechanism, then yes, the application can go and update itself. Usually though, we don't recommend you give your users admin rights for obvious reasons. And if that's the case, then the application updater won't happen. The other thing that we can do is we can say, hey, the next time you reboot, go and revert this to what it was before. So yeah, you, you could have maybe manually forced an update and somehow given elevation for admin rights, but we still control the package. So the next time it loads, it'll go back to its state that it was when it was first installed. So there's a lot of options here. Not not exactly the same thing, but we can actually make packages expire too. So this use case came up from a um, from a college, and they said, "Well, what about at the end of the semester? We are we know the semester is going to end on November the 25th. Um, can you just make those packages expire? They no longer work and they disappear." The answer is yes. That's a great point, Jason. Thanks for bringing that up. Someone asked, uh, are there limita limitations with FlexApp One application when compared to regular FlexApp? For example, FTAs, context menu, services, click to layer. Basically, does it offer the same feature set as regular FlexApps? One in the same, because what winds up happening is first you create a FlexApp, then you convert it to FlexApp One. The only limitation currently, and this is more than likely subject to change once we get out of Prod Rev One, is the eight gigabyte limit for a package because we have a four gigabyte limit for compression or for the for the executable we're using compression here we get around a 2.1 to 1 compression ratio rate so aside from that eight gigabyte limit no every standard part of flex app still applies on that someone asked what is the overhead of the embedded flex app client in the flex app one packages Identical to standard FlexApp, it's just included in a self-extracting single executable. Yeah, and it's just a service. It's, it's, uh, you've got some people out there that claim to do similar things that we do. They have a player that has to be installed to every endpoint and has to be kept updated. This service will be put on the endpoint, and if you've got a newer package, a newer version of the service, it'll default to that service. It'll make sure you have that service. So there's, that's a big advantage, not having a fat client out there as a player. All right, I think we're in our last couple comments and questions here. Um, I think we kind of addressed this one earlier, but we'll double check. Would these applications be detected by security scanning software such as Nessus? Yes, because again, they're, they're natively installed. So if you recall during my demo, when I ran through all three versions of Windows, the applications were present in Admin Remove programs, they're present in C program files. The OS doesn't know they're not there. They're, they're just, as far as it's concerned, Everything's there as it normally would be. So yes, security software still sees these as normal applications. So that's a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's ultra secure. On the other hand, you do have to make your applications aware of your AV and vice versa. So if you have an application that needs exclusions because it doesn't play nice with AV, FlexApp doesn't change that. The security, mm -hmm. the security picture is still the same. Yep, and, and, and in the case of what I demonstrated, for example, when you get an executable that hits a desktop that your security system doesn't recognize, it could flag it. So you may need to add an exception. I've seen that in my own demo. And we saw it in my demo here a couple times when I was playing around with Windows 11, that even though I was running some really weird stuff, Windows security was picking up on it. And it would have mm -hmm. done that if it was a flex app or not. It's all native. Yep. Right. Excellent. Last question. Can you even differ between Office versions between users on the same machine? We don't recommend it. There are ways to do it, but what winds up happening is you create a lot of filter driver conflicts and there's a lot mm -hmm. of overhead. So the short answer is yes, it's possible, but the long answer is it's very resource intensive because yep. when you have that many conflicts between the activation mechanism and the copy protection and all the crazy stuff that Microsoft does in modern versions of Windows to keep it a walled garden, 
there's going to be a lot of overhead. So short answer, yeah. Long answer, we don't recommend it. You also need to think about an application strategy, right? FlexApp, we firmly believe, is going to be right for the majority of your applications. And and 90 plus percentage rate, very few applications we ever run into cannot be FlexApp. It's, it's, uh, it works so well. But should you? Is Office needed by every single or 50% of your users? You may want to put that in your base image. Um, if that version of Office and the other 50% need the other version, you put it in that base image. So yeah, you have two base images. But this is something that our SEs will walk over with you. Office is we can we can uh, flex that Office, but should you? Because there's so many license considerations, KMS server and so forth, that it's it's going to oftentimes be easier to put applications used by every single user in the base image. Right. And what we usually see is clients will ask me, hey, Matt, I have base office for my entire organization, but what about Visio? What about project? What do I do about that? So again, FlexApp is an excellent use case there because to Jason's point, you can still put office in the base image and then I can put a FlexApp copy of Visio or project alongside of that. Now that's a really complicated recipe. But again, our own architects and engineers know how to do it backwards and forwards. So if you want to see that firsthand, let us know. We can show you. Excellent. I think we got through all our questions. We've got a bunch of comments here that thanking us for the demo. Everything looks really great. Um, Matt and Jason, thank you for taking us through. Everyone who stayed on, I know we're about 10 or 11 minutes past the the scheduled ending time, everybody who asked questions. Um, this was a great session. So thank you everyone for attending. And again, Matt and Jason for bringing us through today's presentation. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to visit us at www.liquidware.com. Uh, reach out to us, uh, sales at liquidware.com. Or if you want to continue on the conversation, another great place to do that is at community.liquidware.com. Matt had mentioned that about the our community site. There's a great place to get some more information out there as well. So with that, thank you everyone and have uh, a great day.